What does it take for us to bring back the once existed biodiversity? UN estimates that 75% of the land environment and 66% of the ocean's environment have been altered by human actions. What does it take for us to reverse this course? Hi, this is Takatoshi Shibayama, the host of the Future Design Podcast. In this episode, I speak with Eugene Wang, CEO of Sophie's Bionutrients, who's creating large-scale alternative protein facilities using microalgae to reduce the burden we're putting on in this environment and increase the food security for the future. He tells us this is a promising technology that can scale bigger and faster than plant or cell-based food sources. So stick around to the end. Well, thank you, Eugene, for being on our show. Welcome to the Future Design Podcast. Thanks for having me as well. Thank you. Great. And we had numerous episodes uh, before. Well, I wouldn't say numerous because we only had three or four of them. But we had three episodes before uh, on plant-based uh, type of solutions for creating alternative meats. And now we have you on board as well. So I'm very excited to have this conversation with you. Now, let's drop the first question is, who's Eugene, who's, back, uh, who's the CEO of Sophie's Bionutrients? Well, uh, you can say that I, I'm a guy whose uh, career, pretty much uh, the whole career, is in uh, making uh, plant meat. Um, starting from my family business, you know, originally I was thinking of uh, becoming a uh, management consultant or investment banker. So that's why I actually went to MBA uh, uh, at Colum- got, my, got my MBA at Columbia University. And I was in New York, and so I want to become professional. But then again, just less than uh, less than a year, I can't stand it. The the life is just so demanding, so exhausting, and <laughs> and I don't like I didn't like it. And then I finally decided that to 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 come back to my family business and join my family business. And my family, for your information, uh, and I told um, uh, many times, a lot of people if they know me, they know that I come from a background where we are four generation Buddhism, uh, three generations making vegetarian food, starting from my grandma and grandpa making vegetarian foods as uh, street vendors. So my father, who is the true scientist, uh, you know, come up with a, um, a factory for the family business. So I pretty much was immersed in, and, 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 and now still immersed in a lot in about how to make plant meat and how to sell plant meat to the people. So that's me before coming to Singapore. But then, then again, along the way, I got, because my prior startup in California, you know, I was starting, I was selling the plant-based seafood, you know, uh, called Selfish Kitchen, uh, because my daughter self is allergic to shellfish. And then a lot of consumers in the U.S. asked me, can the products have equivalent nutritional value like the real seafood? That's how got me into this microalgae protein research because I was looking for a way for people to get the nutrients directly from the ocean without using the animal. Basically, that sums up my whole career, I would say. Uh, pretty long answer, but you got the picture. <laughs> yeah, sure. And your company's name uh, starts out with Sophie's. And you gave me a really interesting story before we did, it, did this recording about why you really got into doing this, not just because your family business is making foods for Buddhists, but you have a real uh, strong story behind that. So can you tell us about that? Yeah. So um, as I was um, researching on, you know, this microalgae protein, how to make it uh, into, originally I was thinking of making it into plant-based seafood. And then along the way, I realized this is actually more, a lot more powerful. You know, it is actually not just can be a plant-based seafood alternative. It has so much nutrients and then you can extract so many things. You can actually almost make a beef flavor strictly out of microalgae, believe it or not, which is amazing because there's actually a company out of San Diego already extracted the hemi. The, 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 B, the bovine blood protein out of microalgae already. And so think about it. If you can extract a lot more different kind of uh, flavor molecules that makes uh, beef flavor, we actually can make a plant-based beef 
with just microalgae. And so that's how I realized, you know, well, this thing is actually not just for plant-based seafood. It's actually for a lot more. It can be a really sustainable protein alternative. Why? Let me tell you why. Because the way we grow microalgae is different from a lot of the, the uh, nutraceutical companies where they want the lipid, they want the color. So they grow it always using the raceway pond style operation. We, on the other hand, we just want the protein. So we grow it in a fermentation tank, in dark, in a bioreactor. And think about it. You know, you, you keep it in that confined space. You save a lot of space footprint. On top of that, because microalgae grows really, really fast, so the short cycle also means that there's less energy, less water needed, and you can produce a lot more tonnage of protein in the same amount of time compared to beef or even soy. And that's why I realized, wow, this is really a sustainable technology for the future. If we want to keep having our own lifestyle that we're enjoying right now and still having so many people coming on board this planet, <laughs> you know, we got to start doing something that's sustainable enough. We can give back this planet the natural nature that was there originally. And by that, I mean we have to stop, we have to start cutting down the way we grow our food. That's just not sustainable, keep going forward into the future. That's why I think this technology is really important and really sustainable. And there are still a lot of people who don't understand it. Yeah, in your website and before we started recording as well, you talked to me about this triangle or this pyramid where you have animal protein on top and you have plant-based foods and then you have cell-based foods and then coming to your product, which is a single-based uh, protein foods. And can you walk us down through this? Because we have already di discussed in these episodes that, you know, 50% of the arable land that we use, or seventy percent, sorry, of the land that we use are are arable land, and then half of that it, are we are using it for growing soys and different animal uh, uh, products for feeding ourselves and and uh, livestock. And I think that way of growing foods are really killing our di di biodiversity of this this plant, plant, uh, plant uh, vegetation that we have and also the types of foods that we can also consume as well and more and more as we as you said uh, on board more people onto this planet and on your website it also says to 2050 we're going to have 9.8 billion people on this planet obviously it's not going to be enough to sustain all these people and we're going to be cutting down more trees killing off more and more biodiversity off of this planet so we have to find different ways to find protein from different sources not just from plants but many different alternatives that we can find. So can you tell us about this triangle again, where, you know, we are mostly consuming this animal protein based foods. And now we're starting to find that there are alternatives to creating meat like pro products by using plants, uh, like in impossible foods or beyond meat. And now we're starting to see companies that are doing and which I picked up as well is these cell based foods. So can you talk to us through through those? Sure. Uh, I got this question the other day. Um, one of the the people listened to my pitch um, in the audience asked me, you know, he said that, well, if the plant-based meat is many times more expensive than the real meat, how can we convince people to convert, to switch over to plant meat? For those people, and I believe in your audience, a lot of people may ask the same question. And what I would say to these people is that you are just not looking long enough. You keep thinking we can live forever like this. You keep thinking beef, pork, chicken, especially chicken, one dollar per kilo. I just heard the other day from a pet food maker. <laughs> you know, you keep thinking that this is the price that are gonna stay forever and never gonna go up then you are absolutely and ridiculously wrong. Why? Think about this picture. Uh, the other day, I was uh, looking at it as some research uh, article. A professor from University of Maryland, he used a satellite radio image and looking back 70 years, and then from all the 70 years prior, 
up until today. Oh, actually, 60, 60, or I'm sorry, from all the way from 1960 when the U.S. first shoot their satellites up, you know. So that about 60 something years time frame, you know, he look at the satellite image, and then he discover, wow, we we have done a terrible job. Why? During this last 60 or so years, we have deforested a huge chunk of the planet. And you look at the image, you know, for those who are interested, you know, I guess you will have my contact information in this uh, podcast or video. You know, they, can, they feel, can feel free to contact me. I can show them how that picture looks like. It looks like almost a quarter or one third of the planet's forest was gone in the last 60 years. And think about it, given 60 more years, how many more will be gone? And there's actually not that many forests that can be deforested and still be good enough for our food and energy. You know, that's, that's what I guess all these deforestation take place for. And so that's why the current animal protein, aquaculture, animal farming, or even agriculture is not going to be sustainable. Another numbers that I can give for, for you to, uh, to reference is that I did a ballpark calculation. If we keep doing this by 2050, you know, the amount of animal protein and agriculture we need, we're possibly looking at one or two more planets, planet Earth, I mean, to be able to get everybody and all the animals, all the agriculture to be laid out nicely, sufficiently, and comfortably. Can it happen by 2050? I don't think so. Mars is not even be dwellable by 2050, <laughs> and not to mention discovering another Earth or two. So that's why we really have to find ways to grow our foods sustainably soon. But don't get me wrong. I'm not saying animal protein and agriculture or aquaculture will go away. They will stay here forever because you will always have some people who want to have those what they call natural food, which in fact, by a lot of standards, that's kind of misconception, which we can talk about if you're interested. But in any case, so the animal protein and agriculture, meaning plant meat, plant protein, will stay, will will still be there. That's why in that pyramid you mentioned, I put it on the top. Animal, because it uses up the most of the resources, so they become the top of the pyramid, which is almost like the top one or two or no more than 5%. And then followed by plant protein, which is the agriculture. And then the bottom, I have the cell base, the culture meat, and us, microorganisms, single cell protein. Why? Because we believe the future of food and nutrients will be all coming out of that bioreactor, that canisters. You saw in a lot of the pharmaceutical or biotechnology companies. Now you saw that, you think this is either the beer brewery or the pharmaceutical factory. Well, Look, watch out, you know, going forward, a lot of the food factory will look just like that. Why? Because this is the most sufficient, efficient, and clean way to grow our micro, uh, I'm sorry, to grow our alternative protein and all kinds of nutrients. You know, we can possibly even grow uh, cooking oil. You know, MicroOG has this wonderful cooking oil. So you can grow cooking oil out of that bioreactor as well. You can grow carbohydrate. A lot of the microorganisms has this carbohydrate. You can turn it into starch so that you can make your noodle, make your bakery, you know? So you can pretty much satisfy all your food needs just with those micro, uh, just with those bioreactors and with some sort of microorganism or with some cell, cell based technology that people are developing. So that's really what we saw the future is. Bioprocessing will be the main way of food production. This is my uh, projection, my 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 uh, forecast for the future. And I believe there there's still a lot of people who who don't understand that. But look at the way we create food today. It's just so messy. You know, you can't keep going on this forever. We have to take it back into that canisters and grow our foods to be efficient and to be giving back the mother nature a clean environment. That's what I believe into the future.
Yeah, I totally agree with you because nowadays, you know, we always see these you know documentaries or you know news articles talking about how we killed off so many different types of vegetation from this world and even animals too because the di biodiversity of animals has gone down dramatically since I don't know, let's say in the 1920s to to now probably 20% of the biodiversity has been killed off. And what we see now is just tamed animals. That's what we have, right? We don't, the, the wild animals that we actually see is just on TV or, or in the zoo. We don't really live with these animals anymore. And what we have is cows, sheep, chickens, and, and all these animals that we actually consume for food. And that's all we have these days. And I think that's what's killing off of how we are connected to nature. We are not part of nature in, anymore. And we have taken ourselves out of the whole nature equation. And we became like, you know, certainly on top of the food chain and controlling what nature and how nature serves us. And I think that we need to move on from that. And this is really why I like speaking to guys like you, because you, you are seeing that and you're making a solution out of it. Now, but the, at the same time, when we we're so immersed in this culture of eating animal proteins and different types of uh, plant-based food, and we can't really fathom of eating stuff from a, a bio lab. And you know, thinking about cell-based foods or single-based protein foods that you're making, we're, it's almost like we're eating space food, right? It's, or like these protein bars that are made out of synthetic foods, and, and we don't really want to eat that either, right? And we're both from a culture where uh, culinary experiences are huge in our in in everyday life and we want different types of cuisines and we want to continue eating those things but also sustainably as well so how does cell based foods sorry single single cell based foods like what you're making can complement that yeah great question actually there are already solutions and you don't have to concern that at all. So look at your diet. Let me give you an example. The only thing that possibly not even culture meat can do, you know, cause, because the scaffolding and the flavoring issues is the steak or the pork chop or the chicken leg or chicken wings you have, because that is too animal like, you know, too original. Let me put it this way. <laughs> so say like some Chinese like the, the pork uh, liver intestine, you know, those will be hard to be replaced by these uh, new technology. I agree with that. So for people who, who just want to eat that, you know, they will keep on eating that with whatever price they have to pay. But the solution is actually already out there in the shape of like spam, sausages, ham, uh, fish balls. Uh, what else? Uh, uh, um, a lot of the deli slices, you know, all these processed meat, uh, especially the lower end, already have been incorporated quite a bit of uh, plant-based protein, which you don't know. Uh, one, ex one clear example is uh, the fish bowls that most of the Singaporeans so so endured, uh, so so <laughs> enjoy it today, you know, a lot of them don't understand. 30, 40 years ago, just 30, 40 years ago, their fish balls possibly would have uh, anywhere close to 50% of the real fish meat because the wild caught fish is still abundant and, and cheap. Well, that's you pretty know, low, 50%. Ball, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to go really way back uh, when they made the fish ball out of the hawker stall. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that was a time when they have 70% of uh, 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 fish, I was told, you know. But then once they moved to the factory, everything started to come down, you know, because they, they have to, number one, lower their cost. They have to make consistency. So meaning that consistency in price, texture, and flavor, and especially price. This is tough. So that's why over the years, what these uh, fish balls makers are doing is trying to find replacement for the wild caught fisheries. And so that's why the fish balls most Singaporeans eat today I guess anywhere between 30, possibly not even 30%, you know, so for, for some high end fish bowl, maybe have 30, 40%. And for the really cheap ones, you only possibly have uh, 15, 20% of uh, real fish there. 
So you know, what's what's and, in there then if it's not fish? <laughs> that's scary so that's to know. That's a great right? question. There, there, there's definitely some starches, and those um, those starch, as you know, are definitely plant based. That's 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 my point. Is that a lot of plant based technology are already incorporated into these processed meat, which people don't know. They still think this is 100% pork spent uh, lunch of meat. They still think this is 100% tuna cans where if you look carefully of the ingredient listing wow soy protein is in the tuna what does it do right here it's a it's a volume enhancer volume uh, additive you know so the cheap ones are already incorporating a lot of these plant-based technologies and that's my point that's my theory is that going forward a lot of these alternative protein will go into those venues will be incorporated into those products why because people who consume those products they want consistency in their daily uh, shopping so that consistency again just like i said consistency in price in flavor and in texture and with all the technology we develop this is easily done and that's where a lot of these single cell protein uh, alternative protein will will be used on that to make your daily staple and then I believe sometimes down the road if culture meat is cheap enough we will also do so in these processed meat as well but if culture meat is not cheap enough they possibly will be used to make higher end meat uh, for people to consume you know something like maybe like minced meat you know uh, uh minced meat uh, using using those uh, possibly will be a, a wonderful uh option you know so that's that's how the way i see how the world is going to adapt using these protein and there's there's so many ways i can talk about like you know a lot of the the, the drinks the protein drinks can easily incorporate these alternative protein as well you know and these are alternative protein is not just about single cell protein we're also potentially can talk about insect protein, which a lot of Asians have no problem with. But in the Western market, <laughs> it's hard for them to digest. But here in Southeast Asia especially, a lot of cultures already consume a lot of uh, box. So if you sell the insect protein as a powder and then incorporate that into the foods, I believe a lot of the consumers will welcome that. And if the price is even more affordable, it will take off here in Asia, you know. Yeah, obviously the thought of eating a, an insect or, you know, putting that actual insect in your mouth is a little bit grotesque in my imagery. But uh, actually, if, as you say, if it's all powdered down and you can't even see it and it's within our protein bars or fish balls or whatever it is, we wouldn't even be able to see it. And if it tastes the same, then, you know, nobody would even know. I mean, when was the last time a lot of people actually look at the ingredients of our real food and decide what we're actually wanting to eat, right? I mean, you know, I was talking about, you know, different types of foods that contain so many different starches and all these other things that are making up for the, the lack of, you know, more nutrient things that are inside our food. And we're not even noticing it because it tastes the same. And all these companies, Nestle, and all these companies are actually making so much progress and trying to make everything taste so much better than uh, what it was before that we don't even notice anymore. Now, let's go down to your product now. So algae. So what is algae? Because a lot of people, when they think of algae, uh, either they think of uh, like planktons or, or some kind of kelp. Uh, can, can you tell us what exactly algae is and what is microalgae? So there's, there are two types of algae. One is macroalgae, the kind of um, water ocean plants that you talk about, kelp, you know, seaweed. Those are macroalgae. So macroalgae uh, today uh, has been consumed a lot in Asia. A lot of people are very familiar with what my, my, macroalgae is. But the problem with macroalgae is that it is, in my opinion, not really a sustainable solution because you still need to grow it uh, in the ocean. And because of the global warming, a lot of the water that's suitable for some macroalgae is gone. It, the water is becoming too hot. And on top of that, uh, ma macroalgae does not have a lot of protein. Mm -hmm. Macroalgae also are subject to a lot of pollutions, heavy metal pollutions in the water. So microalgae are referring to those microorganisms in the ocean 
or in the fresh water. So microalgae, on the other hand, is not big, so you can't really see it clearly unless they are in a huge number because of the color you will see it. And you will usually see it more clearly under microscopes. And so microalgae usually will be single cell or maybe multi-cell creature. Now, there are roughly two camps of microalgae. One camp is true microalgae, which has the cell wall, making them a real plant, you know. And this type of microalgae usually are single cell. There is another camp of microalgae that does not have any cell wall and could be single cell, could be multi-cell. These, um, in, um, some, to some scientists, these are what they call cyanobacteria, which means that they are, scientifically speaking, should be bacteria, but in a lot of their features, their characteristic, looks a lot more like microalgae because a lot of them are not toxic either, you know. And so, so we call all these microalgae because number one, they provide a lot of nutrients and number two, they are fast growth uh, and, and, and can be easily harvested for a lot of different kind of nutrients. And people, uh, the history of using microalgae can date back about almost 200 years ago. So there's, there are actually a lot of studies, a lot of research, especially uh, uh, in Europe and in Japan. You know, there's tons of research about microalgae. And, and, and you know, judging from the nutrition they have, you know, this is what I want to say. Um, recent fossil records just confirmed that microalgae is the mother of all plants. So we all know that on this planet, we first have plants, we then have animal. So you can also say microalgae is actually the mother of everything, every living thing on this planet. And that's how nutritious, how inclusive in terms of nutrition microalgae is. You can find all the essential amino acids human body needs in microalgae. You can find vitamin B12, which is lacking in most of the plant-based protein today in microalgae. You can find a lot of fatty acids, DHA, EPA in microalgae. You can find a lot of different other kind of nutrients, chlorophyll, beta carotene, you know, you name it. You know, it's just so many. The list just goes on and on and on. It, it is really the natural superfood. And so that's why we research on this microalgae and, and trying to make it into food. I think uh, in terms of micro fermentation, the area of growing alternative protein using micro and using fermentation technology, we are one of the very few teams that is studying uh, microalgae. The rest of the teams that I know in US and Europe, they're mostly studying on uh, a lot of the bacteria or yeast. Uh, not a lot of them are really researching uh, microalgae like we do. And so that's why, that's how unique um, our strain of uh, microorganism is. And that's why I have a big hope about our, the future of our business. I really think that w our products will make a very unique differentiation in terms of nutritional value. Yeah, it sounds like compared to, let's say, cell-based meat, where you use stem cell technology to grow a certain part of an animal and consume it, microalgae, you could, you, basically what you're telling me is that you can kind of find it anywhere. And in, also you say that you can grow this very quickly as well, as stated in your website as well. Cause, so can you tell us a little bit about how the processing of microalgae and how that gets into uh, a, a food-based source? Great question. So, you know, this is the difference between, you know, even though we're both bioprocessing, but the difference between our microalgae fermentation and those uh, cell-based culture meat is this, is that we are growing a live thing, a living thing. While the cell-based meat industry, I wouldn't call it dead, but they're growing the tissue cell, which does not have the soul, you know, and our microalgae the way I grow it, I feel like they are almost like a pet, like my baby, <laughs> you know? Interesting, is, interesting thing is that if you keep them happy, they will grow more protein for you. 
if you starve them, you keep them stressed, they grow more lipid fat for you. And in our case, because we want the protein, so I have to find ways to please them, to make them feel happy. You know, at one time I also almost told my scientists that, hey, let's play some classical music <laughs> next to the bioreactor. <laughs> Not because of the, the music, the, the sound, no, but because the wave I was thinking. You see what I'm saying? And, and so that, that's how ridiculous, how lively the thing is. And, and so the process is like this. It's, it's, it's very easy. It's that, so we put it in a dark fermentation tank. So microalgae, uh, this is a little bit technical, but let me explain to you and your audience a, a little bit more, is that microalgae can do two things at the same time. One is called autotrophic. Autotrophic is converting the sunlight into energy, which is almost all the plants can do autotrophic growth. So that's one thing microalgae can do. Another thing microalgae can do is heterotrophic. So heterotrophic is like you and me and all the insects or even bacteria. We have to eat organic stuff and then convert it into energy. And that's heterotrophic culture. And so microalgae, especially the string that we select, can do these two, thing, two things at the same time. And so when we put it in the dark fermentation tank, it will go on the heterotrophic operation, meaning that it will eat organic substance to grow. And in our case, we use molasses in our tank. Molasses, as you know, is the, uh, 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 the industrial food waste from the sugar refinery. And some uh, health food store actually sell molasses because people think that is actually still very nutritious stuff. And so we use that to grow our microalgae. They convert the glucose, the carb carbon and nitrogen in the, in the liquid into protein. And then we harvest the, the cell, we then extract it for the protein. How we extract it, we have to first break the cell wall and then remove all the lipid, the, the chlorophyll, the fiber that we don't want, and then it becomes the pure, uh, uh, high-end, uh, high-purity protein that is actually colorless, like as white as almost like the wheat flour. And then you can use that flour to make plum milk or even uh, plum meat. Now with the plum meat manufacturing, there's a little bit explanation or technology process I have to explain. But then again, you know, in, instead of boring your audience or, or your listener, I think um, with that high purity protein flour, basically we can replace the role of uh, soy protein flour or even whey protein flour. Whey protein is uh, the protein flour from cow milk. So that's the functionality, that's the beauty of our microalgae protein flour that we can offer next year in the market. And is there a way to just keep, you know, shining sunlight into this and, and grow this without using uh, molasses or other, or other types of uh, organic matter to feed them? Absolutely. If you use the sunlight operation, you can still grow them, yes, but it will be slower. The autotrophic operation uh, will be slow. It will take more days, number one. Number two is that it will be too dark, the color, because undergoing the photosynthesis, their chlorophyll will be abundant. And then that dark color is not always not wanted by a lot of food manufacturers. Because think about it you possibly don't want your tofu to be dark, right? <laughs> you don't want your um, fish ball to be dark. You don't want your uh, uh, milk alternative to be too dark. You can have your uh, plant meat to be dark, you know? So if your protein flour is too dark, your application will be very limited. And so that's the downside with using sunshine. But we are, speaking of which, we're currently de developing a, um, a half sunshine technology for one of the investors coming from Oman. And so as you know, the Middle East country, they have abundant of sunshine, only seawater, no fresh water, just like Singapore, you know. So we're planning to use uh, marine string using seawater to grow microalgae using sunshine. And this will be the first time in human history that that is actually using seawater in the agriculture-like uh, 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 production of uh, plant-based protein. And it will be very interesting to see that project unfold and uh, making some progress. Because as we all know today, the freshwater 
is being used up and and because the global warming it's getting rare uh, scarcer and scarcer you know and also because of the population growth so we really need to find ways to grow our food and nutrients using brackish water or even seawater and so that's uh, another project that we're working on at this point interesting and and in these uh, processors how so you're feeding these organic matters uh, to these microalgaes so how long does the process take to actually formulate them into you know consumable product wonderful question another wonderful question so you know let me tell you you know in our calculation you know we can make one ton of uh, plant meat every day out of our facility in Singapore. And if you're talking about a batch, you know, so so if I say, you know, how much time does it take from a batch, a petrol dish of microalgae to become your foods on the table? In our calculation, that's under seven days. That's how fast we can make foods. And compare that to beef, you're talking about two years. <laughs> and even plant meat, which is soy, you're talking about three months of growth and possibly another two months of uh, distribution and processing. So minimum almost uh, half a year, right? And in our case, it just took us seven days using our technology and our business model, you know? And so, so that's how speedy and that's how resource saving using this technology. And definitely feeds into the whole circular economy concept as well, because you're using residue from the food. I would I wouldn't want to call it waste because now you're using that for your your feed. But these uh, the the residues that are coming out from you know sugar canes or 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 uh, um, any any type of products that you're using, and then feeding them to this uh, to these microalgae. So it, it, you're definitely using all these things that can be circulated so that uh, nothing goes to waste, basically. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, you know, th this this is also one of our uh, future design is that, you know, it will be a a technology that we can we can put inside the city, which is very important because, I mean, you know, that that's that's what we want to do is that we want to make this uh, 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 technology a truly sustainable technology technology that's serving the, the population, serving the people, the market without uh, too much carbon footprint. So that's why setting up our shop here in Singapore is so important is that imagine if you can grow your foods, grow your protein in a city state that doesn't really have a lot of, have a lot of land space, that doesn't even have their own fresh water. And we can grow tons of protein out of this city state and even export. People will say, wow, that's amazing. And then they realize, wow, we can actually grow foods without much of the space and without much of the water and energy. And that's what we want to demonstrate. And that's why Singapore is so ideal, so perfect for this technology to be unfolded, to be unfolded and to be developed, you know. Yeah, and if we talk about food security, this country is definitely on the brink of always losing that security, right? Because let's say even with during these COVID-19 situations, a lot of the food supplies uh, were in danger of being limited. And there was a lot of run to grocery stores for people to stock up on foods because they were very worried that, we, you know, all the grocery stores will be out of food. And, and this definitely helps Singapore, countries like Singapore, where everything, pretty much everything on based on food is reliant on uh, global imports. And I think that, you know, gr changing Singapore into a, a state where you can grow their own food, uh, maybe not agriculturally, but in, in, in your ways, uh, that uh, it helps the stability of soup, food supply in Singapore. Right. And Taka, I, I want to I wanna add on an other comment on, on, on this uh, related topic is that a lot of the people don't understand, a lot of Singaporeans don't understand, a lot of the, the government agency don't understand this either, is that this is my personal ob observation is that Singapore down the road in the future will be the pioneer and the leader in terms of food production into the future. Why? Because the way Singapore is growing food today is exactly what I imagine people on this planet will have to be forced to grow their foods 
if not 30 or 50 years into the future, at least maybe 80 or 100 years into the future, which may be too long for a lot of people. But then again, think about how Tesla, how Edison, you know, discovered those amazing in invention and how much impact they had on us today after 100 years. And that's what Singapore is is doing right now. And it's so, so unique and so important is that, you know, the way we grow our food, in my opinion, is just like what Singapore currently is doing. Everything should be in the building. Everything should be contained, should be controlled so that we don't mess with our environment and we can get close to the consumers, to the market. And then how can you run that operation efficiently without using too much energy and then produce enough volume? And so you're talking about indoor farming vertical farming, hydroponic, and indoor chicken farms, aquaculture, or even the floating uh, cow farms that ne Netherlands are testing and Singapore also seem to be interested. You know, and then there there is the cell-based meat that we're developing, cell-based seafood, uh, like in Shok's case, you know. And then there is single-cell protein, like we're developing the, micro, the protein from microorganisms, and even the indoor insect farm so to speak. So these all together, in my personal opinion, is really the future of the food production. And how can you make it efficient, make all the operations efficient, and then how can you house it right inside this city? And then down the road into the future, we may really need to make this a bubble. Why? Because the planet Earth is so warm, so ruined by our activities today and then down the road in the future it is really not suitable especially it's too hot we may really have to put a dome outside of big city like what we saw in a lot of the comics and in the future movie you know i i personally was thinking you know looking at the, into the future i think that that may not be too crazy that may be the way we live our lives in the future and think about it when you move on to mars that's possibly how you can duplicate what we do here and be able to live on Mars comfortably. So you build up a big dorm uh, to, uh, for a city and then everything is controlled inside and so you grow your foods inside. You don't contaminate outside of the domes. And inside the dome you live comfortably and you really wanna venture out, you venture out. But then again, you keep the nature intact, unpolluted, you know, and so that's that's how I see the future is. And if you believe that is going to be the future, that's what I'm saying. Singapore is really on the leading edge. Singapore will be the pioneer. Yeah, I totally see that. And, and for many uh, companies that are working in Singapore, I, I see the biotech industry probably being one of the strongest uh, because of these uh, reasons. And going forward for your product as well, I think this will be the food that a lot of people will consume in the future. How do we how do we get to a place where we actually are actually eating animal-based, plant-based foods into these uh, products that you're creating? I mean, what is the timeline for this? And what kind of foods can we see using your product? Right, so um, in, in, in the case of our um, microalgae protein, it's actually gonna be very fast uh, because if we can raise enough funds, and then build up a big enough uh, bioreactor or fermentation tank, we can immediately drop the unit cost down to the level that can be competitive to a lot of the plant-based protein today. So what you will see is that a lot of these uh, big uh, plant meat makers, plant milk makers that you know of today will start to use our protein, say in uh, maybe uh, two to three years or at least four to five years, you know, but I, I, I seriously think in two to three years, you will see our ingredients in the market already. That's number one. And number two is that I think, uh, you know, uh, for cell-based meat, you know, they will need to take a longer uh, term time frame because a lot of their technologies still need to be developed. So maybe like Shok say, you know, they will first appear in very high-end restaurant in the next two to three years but you won't see it in the grocery stores for about another 10, 20 years. And that's not the case for us, you know, for, for us, you know, I'm pretty sure uh, you will even see it in your grocery stores at least within five years. 
uh, let me give you one example. We're working with this uh, food manufacturers here in Asia. They're interested in using our microalgae protein and make it into a functional protein drink. And that protein drink is actually available in all the supermarkets right now, even in Singapore. And that that market is about 1.6 billion US dollars. And the product that we design right now is only about 50% more expensive than the original animal protein drink that we're trying to replace. But we believe we can sell it, right? Because the 50%, after the 50% uh, uh, increase, it is still within single Singapore dollars per bottle. You know, meaning that you don't you don't pay more, you actually don't pay more than five Singapore dollars for that single bottle of drink. And then, so it's 50% more, but then we will focus on our feature. We don't have antibiotic, we don't have growth hormone, you know, and that by itself, we believe we can convince consumers to switch. And so that's why I believe with our protein flour, it possibly will see it, uh, if not within three years, at least uh, within five years here in Asia. And what is the name of that protein drink? Uh, it's actually um, a, a replacement for the chicken essence, you know. As you know, the chicken essence has been drank uh, by a lot of the, mm. the people here in Asia already, you know, so that's a big market. And what we ha found out is that our microalgae protein actually have this wonderful muscle tissue repairing functions as well, because it's growing so fast, so, so it has this uh, unique, uh, 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 what they call uh, uh, growth factors inside algae. And then by extracting the protein, we extract that growth factor as well. And then you drink it, and especially if the purity is high enough, you can get enough dosage to get your body repaired, the tissue repaired. And, and, and so especially for women who gave birth or who is having their uh, period pain, you know, these type of drinks are pretty popular. And you saw it in the grocery store. And so we're coming out with a plant-based version. And as you can imagine, you know, that's a wonderful and easy thing for you uh, to have. Right. And then what does it take until so that these prices will come down to the same level as the products that we have today? So uh, in order to be that, um, two things have to happen. Number one is definitely the consumption. You know, people will have to consume it more and more. And, and for that to happen, we definitely need to sign on more manufacturers to use our protein in their formulation. So that's one thing. Another thing, well, these two things are actually interconnected, is that we have to have a bigger production bioreactor, bigger production scale in order to lower the cost. So what we found out is that the bigger the tank we use, the lower per unit cost will be for our production. And so say right now we're using a 10,000 liter fermentation tank. And if I can use a 100,000 fermentation tank, my costs drop tenfold. You know, I'm sure as you say, it will be just one tenth of what I'm producing right now, you know. And then if I use a 600,000 ton, which is the industry largest uh, bioreactor, you can imagine that my price drop all the way that I can possibly be competitive to the animal protein right away. You know, so that's what it takes is that consumption and bigger production volume. And as you can see, these two are interlinked, but I'm very confident judging from the interest level of the new protein from all the markets in the world today, I'm pretty confident we'll get there, you know. And I guess you're on in a fundraising period as well. As well, yeah, that's right. Uh, we're uh, raising, we, we closed our seat from uh, seat run funding uh, not long ago uh, because of the pandemic. And now we're uh, gearing towards our A run funding, which is 5 million US dollars. We hope uh, to use that to uh, finish up our uh, first uh, production center here in Singapore in Science Park 2. That would be our showcase factory, but already big enough to produce a lot of protein. And so uh, if we can do that, you know, we will be able to move on to the next round, which we can build a truly um, a scalable, uh, efficient, uh, uh, big 100 uh, liter, 100,000 liter uh, bioreactor, hopefully down the road in the future. Yeah. Well, I wish you all the luck in the world. Uh, I, and, and I'm very hopeful that we'll see these in our tables to consume very soon. So thank you very much for your time. And I, thank you for the wonderful, Stories they tell. 
Hi, this is your host, Takatoshi Shibayama. Thank you for listening all the way to the end. Now, if you enjoyed or disliked the show, please let me know by writing in the comment section. The only way I can improve or add value to you is through your voices. If there are any topics that you would like me to pick up, please also let me know in the comments. I'd love to start chatting with you all. And if you would like to continue watching the show, please subscribe. Thank you.